When curiosity takes hold and imagination takes over, where will you find your answers? What will you do when inspiration strikes? Come in close and listen closer. Go beyond the constructs of today and invent your own tomorrow. So, what will you create? Making science and technology popular by linking it to everyday life is not a new idea. What is new is that this progressive hands-on philosophy now has a home. The National Science and Technology Centre, Questacon, helping to shape Australia's future. Every future begins with the power of ambition. And behind every ambition is a dream. A dream to fly. A dream to build. A dream to create. Now imagine a place where you can explore your dreams. Where your curiosities are answered, your ambitions celebrated, an ambition to become a pilot, an ambition to become an engineer. ambition to become a scientist, or even an ambition to see a brighter future. Welcome to Syria Energy Lab. Your ambitions begin to make the future. Let's make the future.
when curiosity takes hold and imagination takes over, where will you find your answers? What will you do when inspiration strikes? Come in close and listen closer. Go beyond the constructs of today and invent your own tomorrow. So, what will you create? there, Explorer. Today, we're excited to invite you back to Questacon, the National Science and Technology Centre. Follow me. Next time you visit us, you'll notice that we're taking extra health and safety precautions in order to protect our visitors. When you arrive, you'll need to check in using the Check-In CBR app. It's easy. Just scan the QR code and confirm your details. It's important to book your tickets online through our website before you come and visit us. Remember to double check your date and booking time. You could print your ticket at home or present your e-ticket to our friendly staff located at the ticketing desk. Thank you. You're welcome. Remember to stand one Mars rover, or for us Earthlings, 1.5 metres away from other visitors and family groups. This is your guide to Questacon. You'll notice that the sessions run as a self-guided experience and that each gallery is only open for a set time. During this period, you can explore some of our exhibits and interact with our amazing staff, all helping you to engage in science and technology safely. Our cleaners are helping us to keep you safe. Our Follow Me cleaning routine was designed to protect our visitors every time they visit. Thanks, team. The way that you interact with our exhibits is going to be a bit different. Let's meet some of our visitors and take a look at some of the signs to look out for while you're exploring. So when you see a sign like this, it means you can explore the exhibit without touching it. Shall we give it a go? One, two, three, big jump. Oh, nice. One like this means you can use the exhibit with your elbow only, like this. This sign means this exhibit is hands-on, but you must use hand sanitizer before interacting. Finally, this exhibit is for experienced hands only. This means asking a staff member to demonstrate how the exhibit works. Unfortunately, not all of our galleries will be opening just yet. Mini-Q and excited Q with our 7 metre freefall slide will be remaining closed for now. We're looking forward to seeing you at Questacon again soon, where you can travel from the centre of an earthquake, to the heart of a beehive, all the way to outer space. See you at Questacon again soon.
When curiosity takes hold and imagination takes over, where will you find your answers? What will you do when inspiration strikes? Come in close and listen closer. Go beyond the constructs of today and invent your own tomorrow. So, what will you create? to you and welcome to Aspect Webinar 2 You've Got This series. I'm Diana. And I'm Lydia. We are from the Science Centre Singapore and we will be taking you through the webinar this afternoon. So the videos you saw earlier were videos from the participating museums for today's webinar. That's right. A quick shout out to the upcoming travelling exhibition that is happening in Science Centre Singapore. The exhibition on prejudice is still in progress, so keep your eyes peeled and if you are curious, do check out the updates on our website. We would like to thank all the participating museums for sharing their videos as well. Exciting indeed. Well, it is a bummer that we are coming to you virtually once again due to the ongoing situation. We hope that everyone stay safe and keep those masks on. Well, without further ado, let's all begin the webinar right away. Let's invite the Aspect President and Chief Executive of Science Centre Singapore, Associate Professor Lim Tit Min, for his welcome address. Associate Professor Lim, please.
for the Asian terms. It was only until when I went to university that I went to check out the dictionary and found out what exactly what it said. But those again labeled you and get you and, and in a way exclude you or, or tease you. But the third one is when I became a child and I became a father. I remember once uh, me and my wife were in a furniture shop and uh, we were trying to buy uh, something for the family. And then one uh, probably well-spoken lady, very professional and very educated, uh, cut in when I was talking to the salesperson. And then uh, uh, and, 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 uh, and she actually thought that I was a salesperson instead. Whether we are perceived in terms of people who may appear to be slightly different from us or may appear as if they are inferior to the norm, so to speak, I think it is a topic really worthy of us discussing, especially when we talk about certain uh, traits, certain, uh, certain appearances or, or certain upbringing that's beyond the control since young or some people are born with. Uh, either a certain predisposition from genetics to, to other kinds of conditions. Uh, we shouldn't, because of them looking different or behaving different, or even when they're brought up in a different setting, and start to not include them into the so called norm. And uh, therefore, I want to applaud the group, applaud uh, the Youth Got It uh, team for coming up with this topic, and I look forward to a uh, rich engagement, a uh, rich sharing by all of you. And I always say that the power of youth should never be underestimated. So I want to thank you once again. I want to now pass the stage back to Diana and Lydia. And may the power of youth be with you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for all today. For those of you just joining us, welcome to SX Youth Got This webinar. Just a reminder that there will also be a recorded version of this available to you. Before we Before begin, we begin with our speakers, we'd, we'd actually like, like to get to know a little bit more, more about you. After all, we want to be as inclusive as, as possible. With that, that we're going, going to do a warm-up warm -up activity. That's right, Lydia. Let's this activity we call Would You Rather? So, you would have to choose between two options, and we will be doing it via the old chart function. So an example, so an example would, be, would be, would you, would you read it for a straw on the beach? Or watch a movie in the theater? Simple, right? Simple, right? Okay. okay, everyone is ready. Do, do give us a thumbs up, up or, or yes, yes in the chat box. Okay, let's see if we have all these yeses and thumbs up on the chat. Just to ensure that we're not talking to ourselves. <laughs> okay, um, I think we have this one too. Yay, great. Okay, so I think we are all good to go. So let's have our first question then. So, would you rather A. Heck or B. Talk over the phone? So you will see the whole thing launch in front, but just be right now. So all you have to do is just choose your Options. So, which one would you rather do? Text or call? So, Lydia, are you a texter or a caller? Well, I think personally, I find an awkward person, so I'd rather do the texting. That makes sense to all of us. So, let's see what our audience is thinking. Really excited for this one. Let's see. And share the results. Alright, All right, let's share the results and see what audience would like to do. It seems that more, more people would rather text texting instead of calling. So, so it seems it like seems everyone's, everyone's just, just as awkward, awkward as us. <laughs> as us. <laughs> now, for now for the second, second question. question. Would you rather A. Go for, go for fine, fine dining, dining or, or B. Casual, casual dining? dining. Mm, interesting question right there. So, so fine dining. Of course, I would say don't do fine dining, but it can be a bit pricey, right? Yep. 
That's right. So let's see what our audience is. Yay! That's so tiny it is. Great. Okay, so now let's find our third question. Just change it up a bit. Let's see which you will pick. Would you rather have everyone to be a little kinder or B, have everyone a little bit more intelligent? Let's see for you two. <laughs> I'm sure there will be like a split of choice here, right? I don't know how much it's called kinder or intelligent. Which one would you choose? Mm -hmm. Tough to say. I would say that what's going on right now with all of you, you could all use a little more kindness. That's true. But people can't eat it and say that they have to fit more into the group. Okay, so let's you think before you do something. So let's see what our audience thinks. Alright, so let's share the results and see what our audience is ready to choose. So we have 67 percent choosing kindness. I guess, I guess kindness, kindness will, will go a really, a really long way um, um, in, the, in long the long run. That's true. So now for our final walk question, we changed it a bit more this time. So would you rather have everyone hear you or have everyone love you? A or B? This is a really hard question. But I don't know. <laughs> I, would I would say, say that maybe I would, I would like, like people, people to be afraid of how, how much they love me. Smart answer, right? Just combine. I combine the two. Yeah. 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 Oh, wow. I thought it would be like. I'm really surprised at the answer, though. I wonder who's that. Mm -hmm. Alright. So let's, so let's share, share the results. results. And by, by a landslide, like 95%. There's still that 5% who goes, yeah. Yeah, there's one, one person. I'm <laughs> <laughs> very curious about who that person is. So, now that we have asked that we have the question class, it's open ended, we have no choice right this time. So, all we have to do is we have to lock on to slide it on top key in the code and type in your answers to the open and the question. So you have to just uh, key in the code or get me to a code. So, so our, our question, question to you is, is what, what is prejudice? And could, and could you think of some examples? examples? Which is just scan, scan the code, code redirect, redirect you to this word cloud, share, share what you think, think, and you may, you may answer multiple times. times. We have, we have our first, first word, hatred. Sexism. You keep those answers coming. Remember, Remember you can some be multiple times, so keep, 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 keep the keywords coming in. I see, I see more words popping, words popping up, up right now. That's 
right. Our first speaker is Jun Ming from Say Yes. We are very excited to hear your topic. Jun Ming, please. more about ageism and how you know from the perspective of the youth how we can overcome it. So a quick um rundown of aging. So by the way, one in six people will be aged 60 years or older. If you do the math that works out about 1.4 billion people by 2030 I'm sure we all know someone who will fall in the age range of becoming an elderly. So we therefore have a rising tide of elderly people. So death so therefore we need to consider how you know everything about the elderly how are we going to approach them so that's something that we have to bear in mind because it affects us and it sort of affects others so a quick question when someone mentions aging or you know old what comes to your mind you know that is in mind as, as i go through i feel free to share later perhaps in the question and answer section do you think you know of the words slow and fast be spirited, for example. So, what do you have in mind when someone mentions aging or old? So, first, I'll be talking about what are some causes of ageism. So, essentially, according to the um, United Nations, ageism is essentially prejudice that is manifested in the way we think, we feel, or act. So, to illustrate, let's say we think that all people are you know, slow, yes. and one day we happen to be walking behind someone who is elderly. And maybe need some mobility agents. In this case, what would you think? Would you, you no? Know, would you be compared to say, oh, look, he or she, you no, know, but they're slow. And then would you then feel frustrated? I'm sure you might, or you might have even thought about that thought might have flashed across your mind. So once you feel that frustration, you might just you know share your experience with your friends or your family, and you might just vent it out. In this case, how you act. So venting it out is how you act. And so therefore, this is how ageism appears. Now, it can appear in many other forms, of course, and it's not limited to just this, but it will be good to bear this in mind as well because ageism can be everywhere and it can manifest itself consciously or subconsciously, however you might choose. Some causes of ageism were actually studied in a book by Professor Ayalon, and it's a key work in fact on um, gerontology and ageing. So she came up with a few theories, and over here I've actually highlighted three of them. So the first one is that the elderly are reminders of our vulnerability and mortality. So in essence, we fear them because they remind us that we want to go home. And they also remind us that you know, one day, no, you know, <laughs> you'll be able to move on. Right? So therefore, adopting an ages you can be understood as a buffer towards you know such a reminder because. It provides a gulf of distance for us in this case. Psychological distance and emotional distance. And the fact that the elderly remind us about how vulnerable it is. Secondly, we embody what we think. Essentially, this can be uh, linked back to the previous example, whereby you know, if you walk behind an elderly person, you might feel such thing. Because we are a product of our thoughts, essentially, in our actions. So, be nice. And thirdly, we are separated by age due to a pre-planned life script in life, you know, from birth, to school, to work, to eventual retirement. It's all essentially pretty much pre-planned as a whole. What this means is that you have a societal expectation, you have a fixed societal script which says, you know, what you should do, what who you interact with, and this you know, pre-planned script might lead to a lack of interaction between the elderly and others, and therefore create a gulf which leads to ageism. So be sharing in this case, you know, a little story of my neighbor who encountered ages of so Mrs. Dow is a lovely lady, she's like really sweet. And we are good friends. So one day she came to the very moment from her usual three but so I asked her what happened and she said she encountered a youth that made nasty remarks her walking speed, her age, and every other thing that she valued you know, is actually her independence in this case. Because you know, and she, she, she lives alone, was aging in place was important. And she felt very sad because she felt that, you know, as an active community volunteer, 
he can definitely contribute way more and she is contributing more to it. So, you know, why are people discriminating against them? Why is there such prejudice against them? So we talked to her again in the chat and she said, hey, look, why not? I talk to them. You see, they're hanging out every day in the neighborhood. You can talk to them, you know, let them understand things in the viewpoint of an elderly person. Perhaps that might not work out. So I'm glad to say that it worked out for her. And they're good friends and they now understand, you know, why the elderly do things with labs a bit slower, you know, why they need a bit more help in this case, and why as young people we should like, you know, respect them you know, and learn from them. Because I think it's totally right and important that we treat them as a valuable gap. So in this case, we should not condone ages you know, and we shouldn't let them make this price right. We should in fact, you know, have a spirit of kindness and in terms of overcoming ages, I want to encourage everyone to break down this part of kindness and the questions that we have to break down the top of your elderly neighbors, top of your parents, you know, or perhaps you know, the exhibitions in various science centers and resources. Often, you know, engage with them and learn about you know, why the elderly you know, can be a source of knowledge and how you, you know, put up your more positive Don't think of them as reminders of. For, for vulnerability and mortality, think of them as you know, things to be celebrated, things to be loved, and think of that, you know, as in that they are good friends. So, I will now end with question number one. How do you want to age? Do you want to struggle against prejudice? Do you like, you know, be kinder, gentle, nice to society? Thank you, Diana. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, hi everyone and good afternoon. Hi everyone and good afternoon. My name is Fatin Amirul and I am also the science communicator in Syria and in Tuna. So I'm also known as Miss Comet and today I will be presenting Prejudice, how we can overcome uh, to be more of an inclusive society. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce to you to Surya Energy Lab. So, Surya Energy Lab, our vision is to be a premier science center in cultivating our youth of today for our leaders of tomorrow. And our tagline is Let's Meet the Future. And these are our focus areas interactive STEM education, sustainable energy, and the 21st century skills. Here are just some of the programs and projects that we are currently. So we have our exhibitions, our activities, our sound studio, and so on. Now today I'll be talking about two types of um, prejudice, uh, prejudice types. So we have ageism and the creative community. So ageism, it refers to the stereotype of discrimination towards other or oneself based on age and prejudice towards an individual background, particularly in the case between the creative and science community. Creative careers are not the most preferred option. So before we continue, I would like to give a bit of a brief that this presentation is particularly about Brunei and our situation regarding prejudice and our youth. Okay? So the experience phase, Okay, when it comes to ageism, when uh, someone is faced by ageism in the workplace, they are often, uh, they lack communication, lack empathy, they have trust issues, they stereotype, and instant different treatment. So this is very apparent in some of the companies or sectors in which the seniors are more, are more of the leader. And when they found out the younger generation, 
collaboration is less coordinated, they tend to be more less open to new suggestions. And the right over here, we have experience faced by creative community. So lucky for all of you, I am actually from the creative background and I am blessed to be in the science field at the moment. So the experience based based on the community is that they are disrespected of their craft. They are not seen or to be taken seriously and seen as a phase, and the artistic group are seen as eccentric or superficial. So where does it come from? When it comes to ageism, the most important um, highlight here is the boomer versus millennial mentality. So this is based on workplace ethics. So the boomer, they believe that when you work hard, it could lead to success. But when it comes to millennial, they believe that when you work smart, it could lead to success. So this so this like clashing of belief tend to get them not to agree on certain things. And there is also negative representation in media and society. So as you know, we are living in a world that is very dependent on social media and technology and media. So it is a very, very clear that people trusted how media represented certain groups. So the next one we have, what, why are there prejudices towards career choices or backgrounds? So in here we have the Bunayan dream. So let me elaborate what is the Bunayan dream. Is it, it is when uh, a child is raised in a very good educational household and they get good grades, they go to the university, preferably um, abroad and they get a job in the oil and gas sector or also the government sector. So that is seen as the Bunayan dream here. So when someone chooses to be in a creative community, it is seen as an unsustainable sector and also it has negative representation in media and society. And also in Brunei, we are very happy to stay, we are very tied to our culture, so we, are, we tend to be so, how does South Syria and New Guinea combat this issue? So, Cell values inclusivity to create a dynamic team. And we have fostered good communication and teamwork, and we offer opportunities for people with ages and background. So, we used to have this one boy, he is a deaf mute, we employed him as a and he is very, very good at his job. So we do not discriminate them and we value what they can offer to our company. And prime audience is, our, is the youth and the projects that values diversity fit for all kinds of learners. And our science communicators are very open to different demographics. So we tend to uh, cater how we teach our visitors or our students in a way that they could understand and how they are comfortable with. So we value having the whole package being creative and also logical at the same time. So that is all from me. Uh, thank you again. So if it, this is how you guys can reach us, our website, our email, our Facebook, and also our Instagram. So that is all from me. Thank you very much. And bye. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Fajan. That was very, very insightful. I do come from a creative background. background. Here I am, and science as well. We are, we are living proof in the hierarchy of the various between the arts and sciences. And I can hope and be just as successful. Well, that's the lady. Let's do it with our audience, so we have two of our YouTube videos that are on. So we are curious, well, actually, I have used this on two questions. If you use two, did you guys please ask two questions, and then we move on? Sure, I'll ask these two questions. I'm using a board here. Yay, okay, yes, we are using a board here. 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 Oh, I'm just 
So I just have to choose which category you think or you are, alright? That's easy. Let's go. Let's go. The first, first question. question. Okay. okay, so are, are you, you A, a, a creative, creative artistic person, person or, or B, analytical, analytical or methodical, methodical, methodical person? person? Let's, Let's go. go. You'll, You'll see people write papers for and then you see the You can see the Suddenly, 
in the future, it would be desirable to be able to provide extensive support to every caller. However, in some cases, people would prefer to have a high quality experience at some of the some of the some of the exhibits rather than to uh, visit all of them. Also, too much information can be tired. If you were to make a tactile map, what would you need to do? The figure shows an accurate bird's bird eye view of the fifth, fifth exhibition floor of Brighton. It shows not only the only the location of each exhibit, but also its uh, exhibit shape. However, even if even if you make it to make it this far, it is difficult to understand if it is too detailed. In addition, each person has different situation, and if they are not used to getting information by touch, it's hard to understand. Of course, it depends on the purpose. It is better to use minimum necessary information in a default form that is easy to understand. Last is the touchable exhibit model. Uh, this story may be similar to the tactile map. Uh, as a science museum, we always try to tell information accurately so that there are no mistakes. However, in that case, it is still difficult to understand the detailed features. The best is to have both the deformed models and real models. It is also important to make it easy to understand when it fits in the palm of your hands and to consider its fragile. In this way, to make the museum more enjoyable, for more visitors, regardless of disability, it is important to think about how to involve the people with some disabilities and get advices from them. And then we should prioritize information and exhibit content. And the photo shows a model of Japan's space rocket, the eight two a rocket. It is not dis displayed in Raikan, but it was an another art museum in Japan and you can feel the dynamism of the rocket taking off by touching the ball small for um, not small for everyone regardless of disabilities. And this method of expression was very interesting. Alright, we are will continue to work together with various groups and we will continue to cooperate with volunteer groups, and school teachers, researchers and designers. And of course, you. Thank you very much for the presentation. Thank you, Thank you so much. Wow. Wow. Right, right, right. That's so much. This is very important. And it's just too small. Well, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lucky. I am 24 years old and I'm coming to you today from Questacon, the National Science and Technology Centre here in Canberra, in Australia. Now, before I get started, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I live and work on, which are the Ngunnawal people, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and extend that respect to any and all Indigenous people joining us online today from across the world. Now, today I'm going to be talking about a topic that is close to my heart. It is called genderism. Now, for those of you who don't know, genderism is like sexism, but with a slightly broader scope. It focuses more on the idea that more traditionally feminine qualities and presentation are less than their masculine equivalent, regardless of a person's own individual gender expression or the qualities that they show. Now, as some of you may have experienced, STEM is often considered to be a boys thing. It's a very masculine field across pop culture, across all cultures. Now, the American Association of University Women has actually noted that the male-dominated culture in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics can perpetuate a non-supportive or otherwise 
as unattractive <clears throat> and make, um, an unattractive culture to women and gender non-conforming or non-binary people. As well as that, they go on to say that there could be a lot of this culture issue due to the fact that there is a much smaller pool of female role models or gender diverse role models when it comes to working in STEM. And in fact, this has led to a lot of different discussions and research. Here in Australia, we have the Australia STEM Equity Monitor. And in 2021, they reported that approximately 24% of graduates from all Australian universities in STEM related degrees identified as female. And these 24% of all of the graduates that we had across Australia were 1.8 times less likely to be working in a STEM qualified occupation than their male peers. Unfortunately, as part of this survey, we weren't able to see if there were any gender non-conforming or non-binary people within these statistics. They go on to report that around 23% of past graduates stayed in STEM long-term when they identified as female, which means we're getting around a quarter of a quarter of the people who are going through STEM degrees. The reason for this in most cases was around harassment in the workplace, be it the language or just general bullying or exclusion. And in this instance, they define long-term as 10 years or more. Now that we know these statistics, we can talk a little bit more about fighting the stigma, but the issue with that is what can we really do? Well, there have been STEM professionals across the world who have started to change the tide by both challenging and changing the culture inside the STEM profession. For example, here in Australia, we have the Girls in STEM Initiative, which is also known as GIST. And they've created a list of principles for educators to help make gender equitable spaces across educational settings. This list includes creating a gender neutral environment through language use and challenging gender stereotypes in science, as well as ensuring everyone gets the opportunity to be hands on when it comes to experimentation. You can also connect learning to careers and modern day role models, not necessarily ones that we have in our school textbooks, as well as engineering collaborative learning opportunities and encouraging a growth mindset for all to consider. That being said, I'm sure a lot of us aren't working in a classroom, so what can we do? And there's actually a fair few things we can. For example, to start changing the culture, all we need to do is be more visible and vocal about the role models that we have in STEM to let more people see themselves in STEM careers. For example, on screen, I have Alyssa Carson, who is the youngest NASA astronaut ever at 20 years old. She is picked to be one of the very first people to land on Mars. As well as that, Sally Ride was the very first female astronaut. And she was also the third woman in space ever, following two cosmonauts, Valentina Tereshkova and Svetlana Savitskaya. There's mm -hmm. also Rachel Levine, who is a former pediatrician and is America's first transgender assistant secretary of health. There's Dharmic Mystery, a Sydney-based microbiologist who is developing a breast cancer detection system by testing for specific lipids or fats in blood and hair. And Amy Searle, who is an Indigenous scientist here in Australia, who has been developing therapies for diabetes that are designed to be used in the remote and regional areas around Australia that don't necessarily have immediate access to medical care. On top of that, we've even got Mike Tosca, who is a climate scientist focusing on collaborating with artists to bring awareness of climate change to people across North America. And Robin Aguilar, who is a non-binary scientist at the forefront of some really interesting genome sequencing technology. Now, this is a very short list of scientists I know who can be named alongside historic scientists like Isaac Newton or Thomas Edison and Neil Armstrong as pioneers of their field who are breaking down barriers and doing some pretty incredible things. But we can take it one step further than that. I'm actually really lucky to be working here at Questicon, I have the opportunity to work with an incredible group of incredibly talented people from a bunch of different cultures and gender backgrounds as well. My team itself, as well as some of the other teams that are audience facing at Questicon, we have around a 50-50 gender split between male presenting and female presenting performance. As well as that, we have a habit of showcasing women across Australia, including a new series that we've been hosting around the centre of some Aboriginal women. Forest Strait Islander communities doing experiments in their own communities in their own native languages. 
We've also been telling the stories of other women across STEM fields and showcasing how diverse the STEM community really is to everyone who comes into our centre on a daily basis. Hopefully this can incite a little bit of excitement in you all and hopefully it can lead to a systemic change in the future. But in the meantime, thank you all so much for having me. And back to you, Diana. Inspiring, Inspiring speech, Lundy. Thank, thank you. you. I love, I love how open and diverse Plasticon is. It's, it's so, so very, very important to have people who are not just talking to groups. In fact, we hope that this webinar is not just that with representatives from different cultures. Let's take a moment to check in with our audience once again. Hello, everyone. Hello, are some of the ways we can overcome prejudices. Studies have shown that prejudices we have are actually learned through association, reinforcement, and modeling. And this can be done through so many things around you, from our media, our friends and family, or even policies. The important thing is to be aware of them and do our best to reduce this impact. I really love that big one, listening to stories of others. Big stories can make such a big difference. We have no idea what people are going through. Thank you everyone for sharing your thoughts and ideas with us. Now it's time for you to ask our new speakers to come to the question and answer segment. What questions do you have for our consensus? Please post them in the Q&A function. Presenters, you may also ask each other questions if you have any. Okay. So, we'll be waiting for the questions to come in. Um, just feel free to see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. No, that's you. Not that one. Uh, press the back and just see your So I think we have our first question. I think so. We'll be interested in all the questions. Yeah. So, so, the first question is Unibow design universal or culture or some designs of the product? Uh, is there a need to localize universal design or is it a form of prejudice? Okay, so me, you want to get a question to answer that question? Hi, so the question is, is there a need to localize universal design? Is it not another form of prejudice? Yes, um, in my opinion, I feel like that is not prejudice. 
because it is just to change the design to fit a certain demographic. So I feel like having more localized some designs will make other people understand the universal design and cater to their own cultures and to their own demographic or groups. I actually agree with again I think that universal design is a really good way to start but the only way that we can know is we do need to localize that kind of design or make changes to it is if it is universally implemented so I think Universal design is a great place to start, and if there are any issues, then we can figure out what those are after they've been implemented and make changes as necessary. Yeah, yeah. Can I agree yeah, too. The um, need, need for, for it, it but I mean, if it's it's like it's say, it's that you has a certain identity where you can add on the culture and like it's okay as well. I'm not really a form of I feel, but yeah. Like, for the audience, you had um, conflicting views, and I'll just like to chat. So, we had kind of that right there to like see our next one. So, how do you think social media is helpful or harmful to protect against amplified prejudice? So, maybe you can have one to answer that question. I am not a very big social media user. <laughs> no, but um, I think social media tends to amplify prejudice because it's much easier to type out something than kind of like you're hiding behind a screen, right? Because let's say, um, you know, because hiding behind a fake identity, I can type anything I wanted. But then again, you know, there are people who can dig you out from anywhere on the web. So I, I you know, it's I think it's um, generally speaking, when hiding behind an, an anonymous screen, people do tend to be a bit more biased towards prejudice. Because it's, somehow it's just easier to feel like you can escape. So I think that form of you know, escape, escapability then you know, gives you an, an, exit, an exit ticket. If you feel that, hey, look, I'm, I'm invincible, so I can do anything. So at least for me, that's not. Um, well, thank you, Chuchu. Uh, so what do you think? Uh, social, social media helps or prevents prejudice? What do you think? Well, thank you very much. Uh, in my opinion, uh, this has both both sides. So, but we we uh, we should believe the nice one. Uh, so, yeah, uh, new technology or new system uh, we evolve. We should use. Uh, more, more, and more precisely, and, and it, yeah, and uh, it we should turn it uh, very nice one, and so. But um, in in talking about uh, S, uh, S, SNS, so yeah, maybe uh, now we should uh, set the if it's, it's a person that that uh, protect the, the SNS uh, SNS. Uh, it's very difficult because, yeah, uh, in uh, SNS, uh, so the uh, one one uh, opinion of your of both spreads so fast, so it's very difficult to control. So, uh, it uh, it's very very important to uh, stop uh, that the one uh, fast, uh, fast time, uh, early time, early time. So, yeah, uh, we should say the people are uh, person that protect and. Yeah, check the, the SMS, I think. Yep, I do agree with that. So, so uh, as our technology more uh, advances, I think we should make use of it, use of it for the greater good instead of, you know, using them. And you're right about how we should uh, try uh, our best to prevent the spread of something. Once you spot it, instead of checking it out, spreading it in the worst So, media, um, what are we next? Alright, so the next question is 
There, there is chronological aging and there's also psychological, mental, and physical aging. While we cannot control time, we can try to be as youthful as possible, physically, mentally, and spiritually. Do you agree? So maybe we can uh, ask Martin first. <laughs> I, I really like this question. Oh, I'm not on mute, right? Yeah, I really like this question. So we can try to be as useful and possibly physically, mentally, and spiritually. Do you agree? Yes, because to me, I feel like age is just a number. Like, I don't really believe that people who are 50 and 60, they always thought like, oh, I'm, I'm 50, I haven't done anything in my life. <laughs> so I feel like age is just a number. And the most important thing is to always keep that in mind, physically, mentally, and spiritually, that even though you are getting older, it doesn't mean your opportunities will stop. So I do believe that, again, people shouldn't limit themselves just because they're aging or they're getting old. So, so well said, Pantin. I agree totally. totally. Doesn't it doesn't matter, matter what our age ages are, are. I think. Um, we, we are how we are only I think that is all for our questions. Any last questions from our uh, chat boxes? Anyone? Yeah. All right, so once we, uh, while waiting for some of the questions to come in, we uh, would like to hear how to also just get to our books in the screen right now with some feedback that we may have. So just do that, or you can also uh, share your feedback by the link that will be shared on the chat box soon. Okay. So, your feedback to us, and we will really hope that feedback will be good and for the future use for future feedback. So, we have another question here. We have another question. Yep. Yes, all right. Last one. Um, future respect and understanding how many inclusiveness are important ground to hold when you see prejudice play out. Do you think some bias against groups should demand of fairness to the extent of harming others? Alright, so that's a good question. Maybe we can start with Junming. For me, I would say, I think fairness is important. Also, but I think um, when it goes to the extent of harm, then you know that's something that, that but at the same time, it might be used to think about you know, how demands for fairness can be interpreted and can be, can be I wouldn't say a lot, but I would say given. So let's say you know, one group demands of fairness, then you should, you should give it to them as much, you know, as you can, but not to the extent where you know it harms others. But rather, I think you know, perhaps compromise with me, you know, you can find common ground, perhaps. I think you know, having this uh, compromise might be useful in terms of reducing the extent of harm. Thank you, Jim. That's actually a good answer. We will have one more. Lucky, what do you think? Um, I I agree with Jim. I think that you shouldn't ever demand something to the point of harming anyone else. However, I don't think any of the things that we've been talking about today, in regards to how we can reduce prejudice and how we can make our spaces more inclusive, could be viewed as harmful to anyone outside of those select groups. All we're trying to do is make things more accessible and inclusive to the people who 
maybe really want to come into a science center or learn more about the things that we're talking about, but don't necessarily have the ability to at the time. Thank you, Lucky. All right, we have one last question. Do you think that it is important to draw in the audience that may otherwise feel that museums aren't for them? And would you choose it so? Okay, shall we go with the slides first? Okay. Uh, so, I really like this question too. So, because uh, I have just gone through a science communication workshop with my colleague, and we talk about the different types of types of visitors that we have in science centers. And we have a group of visitors that we feel like they only enter science center because they have nothing else to do, or they're not really into science in the first place. <laughs> so, but then we believe that when it comes to these people, we should really draw them in into the science into science centers because. I feel like a science center should be a bridge between people who are not really into science and people who are really into science. And we have to merge them together to create a better and a more acceptable environment. Even though you are not into science or you're just, you don't even know what is a science center in the first place. So I do believe that we should draw people in. I believe so as well. It's very important that we reach as many people as possible. Uh, let's, uh, let's hear from, hear from Tatsuro. Tatsuro, what do you think? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, this theme is my, love, my lovely thing. So, yeah, uh, sometimes we, we, should, uh, we should overcome the, uh, uh, sorry, uh, we, we should uh, gather the, the, the people who are not interested in science at first, because, yeah, there, there are many, many, many people who, that, that uh, they are not interested in science, but um, so th there are uh, some some ways uh, to uh, inv uh, involving them. Uh, for example, so yeah, now we have Olympic Olympic sports game. Uh, so uh, who who have interested in Olympics and sports game, we want to uh, gather them. Uh, if we want to gather them, uh, for example, or we can deal with. A sports science and technology uh, and then so we can uh, involve involving the uh, these people who have just who are interested in sports so like this uh, uh, sometimes uh, we can uh, get together more and more more and more people who, want, who are not interested in science and technology now yeah but they will they will just be in future thank you All right, thank you, Satsuro. Uh, if you look at the chat, chat box, we actually have one more question. Yeah. So, bringing in uh, the team of childhood from the uh, uh, anecdote. Uh, yeah. How do you think prejudice should be conveyed to children in a place like the science center? Basically, it's how many young do you start to educate a child on the topic of tragedy and things like our science center? How do we play a part in teaching these kids, young kids, on what tragedy is? So, would you like to be on a discussion? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in my experience, I don't think that prejudice is necessarily something that is inherent, especially not when it comes to children. I think it is something that they might be taught by society or potentially by the pop culture around them. Like I know I've got two very young nieces and they've started quoting movies and TV shows and some of the things that they've been quoting have not necessarily been very nice and they've been saying them to people in public. And it's something that I think like I said, it isn't necessarily an inherent thing, but it is something that we're taught. And until we can have those conversations, especially with children around the things that they say and the things that they do and why necessarily they might think the prejudiced things that they might be presenting might be the best place to start. Yep. yep. 
I really agree with what Lucky said. It's not something that children are not are not really prejudiced naturally. I feel like it is more of a how they are conditioned as they grow up. So I feel like when they enter the science center, they should have this experience in which they know there is no judgments, there is no mistakes, and you are you are open to doing to having trials and errors and it's all okay and you have to have this inclusivity that that this program or this activity that they're doing all of them can do it it doesn't matter about their backgrounds or their race you should really cultivate such programs that is open for all especially for children I think that, 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 that being said, I believe Science Center in Singapore also has uh, an upcoming exhibition coming up on prejudice that perhaps you can bring your children uh, to visit and learn more about. So uh, do check out the site on any updates on that. Alright, let's just give you one last question. No, if there is no more questions. Great. Thanks so much, everyone, for your questions and our dear new speakers for your answers. So once again, we will be uh, requiring your students to take one year to sit by form, which we have shown earlier. You can get the job that you see on the screen or the link that we can send in the speaker chat box to give us your honest feedback. Yes, yes feedback is important for us to better improve for our, our upcoming projects and events as well. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you for those who are here with us on Zoom Zoom and for those watching us on YouTube Live. If you'd like to speak to us further, drop us in our feedback form and we will reach out to you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a happy Valentine's Day.